Hello, everybody, uh, and welcome to today's webinar, Building an Effective Board of Directors uh, with Mark A. Pfister. Uh, my name is Nick DeBoer. I work here at Passageways. Uh, today, we're going to be exploring the importance of creating an effective board of directors at any stage of business growth and provide a roadmap to successfully plan and build an effective. Uh, first, some housekeeping items just to get out of the way. Uh, we're going to be sending every attendee uh, of this webinar a copy of uh, the, the slide deck and a recording to the webinar. So there's no need to worry there. Uh, if at any point during the webinar uh, you have a question, uh, there's a opportunity on the right hand side in the go to webinar interface to, to submit questions. We have time set aside at the end to, to cover uh, as many as we can. Uh, finally, when the webinar is complete, there's going to be a post webinar survey. Uh, it helps us improve and get feedback about what's going on. We'd greatly appreciate it if you take a moment uh, to fill that out for us. Um, so here at Passageways, uh, we build the next generation board meeting solution called Onboard. Uh, it's a complete governance software suite that allows you to securely prepare for meetings from anywhere. It has all the tools you'd really expect uh, and more from uh, board meeting software, like annotation sharing, uh, complete archives of your board meetings, the ability to search all that information. And it's designed to be just really intuitive and accessible to directors of any tech level. Uh, we'll let you know a little bit more about the product at the end, but if you're at all interested in starting a free trial after this webinar, uh, we have that available at passageways.com or you can navigate directly to passageways.com backslash onboard. Um, now then without any further ado, uh, let me today uh, introduce today's host, uh, Mark A. Pfister. Uh, Mark is the CEO of MA Pfister Strategy Group, uh, an executive management firm that serves as strategic advisory council for uh, executives and boards in private, public, and nonprofit sectors. Uh, he's the chairman and CEO of the Integral Board Group and uh, the creator of Boards as a Service uh, Engagement Model, which is credited with inventing a new industry. Uh, Mark, how are you doing today? Very well. Thank you for having me. I'll turn this on over to you. I'm excited. <clears throat> Great. Thank you, Nick. And uh, a special thank you to Passageways and to you, Nick, and to Mohanish for making this possible today. I thank you, you all very much for that. Uh, and welcome to everybody on the on the webinar today. So I'm I'm always excited to give these webinars due to the fact that uh, they can have a significant impact, especially for those that are either sitting on boards currently or for those that are working in private companies or planning on building boards in private companies or rebuilding boards, say in the nonprofit space. Uh, this this methodology and this architecture can have a profound impact uh, in those areas. So again, it's one of the reasons I'm always happy to share this information uh, due to the impact it can have. If we walk through uh, just a, a couple of things here, I want everybody to keep in mind on this webinar that uh, I'm utilizing this architecture and this structure to explain both the building of a new board, as I've mentioned a moment ago, but also the rebuilding of an existing board. And this is true for private, public, or nonprofit organizations. Uh, this architecture and structure uh, process can be repeated for all of those types of organizations, whether the board is already in operation or you're planning to start a board from scratch. So we walk through today, I like to always uh, announce what we view as our goals and what we want to walk away with. So keep these in mind as we go through today's webinar. Number one, why build or rebuild your board? I'll give you some of the foundational areas and uh, responsibilities as reminders of why we want boards and what their purpose should be and what their expectation should be. Number two, I will share with you some of the foundational structures, such as number two, the board's sphere of influence, number three, a board's planes of congruence, which adds character to your board, uh, rolling into number four, which are the board committees, a little bit of an understanding about where the work gets done on a board and how you keep that separate from the day-to-day -day or, or to say the scheduled board meetings to keep them as uh, high level as possible. And at the end, we'll talk a little bit about how do you ensure success and what are you measuring your board development or your board build or even the operations component against. So those are the five steps that we'll take today as we as we walk through the webinar. So a few reminders as we start. So there's five that I like to remind those that are either on boards currently or they are aiming to be or sit on a board in the future. Um, in the future, um, we'll start out with number one. Boards are there to promote meaningful action meaning they're driving strategic focus, they're guiding prioritization, they're preventing goal diversions. In many cases, whether it's an executive director of a nonprofit or a CEO of a private or public organization, uh, this promoting meaningful action of the board is extremely important because it gets you above and beyond just the thought process that you're there for governance. 
the role I view is, is much bigger. I, I view governance obviously as important, but I also see involvement at the levels of strategy uh, support and in some cases even working alongside a CEO at the board level to help with that strategy creation. So it's one example of how uh, meaningful action can be promoted and that is the role of the board. Number two. Board, boards foster accountability. They promote discipline. They act as a critical sounding board and they emphasize urgency. All very important components uh, for any type of company, whether it be private, public, or nonprofit. Number three, boards convey trustworthiness. Now, we can see many instances in the recent three, four, five years where somebody on the board did not live up to their expectations or, or were caught doing something that was not at the level of what a board director should be doing. And we know how that's affected the company. Uh, Uber is a great example of this uh, in the last few years about uh, issues with, within their board. So in this conveying as tr trustworthiness uh, builds brand comfort, it builds credibility, and shows that the company attracts professionals. This, by the way, I will say this, uh, this is not just true for public companies, I will say this definitively for nonprofit as well as, well as private companies. It's a great uh, area or remember, uh, one of the top reasons to build your board, number three. We move to number four, boards grow networks. This seems like a given, but I can tell you that the um, structure of a board, although this is very important, this sometimes is the only reason that a board member is asked to join a board. We'll talk a little more about the depth you want to add above and beyond just the growth of networks uh, and the expanded connections to people. But of course, very important, uh, number four. And number five, boards provide mediation. And I kind of laugh at the picture I always put uh, behind this one. Uh, many of the boards I work with are in the private realm and there are multiple family members. And just because they're family doesn't mean that they're going to get along or they're going to agree. Uh, boards in this case have been instrumental in keeping the peace and getting to much higher outcomes or better outcomes for any groups inclusive of, of family members that happen to sit or be leadership on a board. Uh, they provide mediation with shareholders and also in tough decisions. You really start to see the character of a board when you have tough decisions or crises that are presented to the board. Uh, this is where the board can really step up and support the executives and the CEO in an organization. Uh, and again, it's a, an important reminder, number five, in providing mediation. So remembering all of those particular areas of importance of why a board is seated and, and how a board can be leveraged let's move over into an area that is not often spoken about and this has to do with the structure of a board and what i like to call the architecture um, i work with well over a hundred boards every year and what i typically see in the reasons that they're bringing me in for my any of my areas of board consulting uh, typically points back to the fact that they were either not built correctly from the beginning or they were not cultivated to stay on that path for a properly constructed, constructed or a properly architected board. So I want to walk through some of the high level areas here of things to look at if you're considering building a board in the future or if you're on a board today and you're just not feeling that it's efficient or it's effective, many times this comes back to how the board was built, how it was constructed, and you can actually start to uh, disassemble the components and look at this from a structural or architectural standpoint. We'll start with this, what I call your sphere of influence. And the easiest way to look at this is the vertical considerations of your board members. And we'll start out in this area because there's a couple of core functions that I like to give some reminders on here, um, and then we'll start to fill this in and we'll move to different areas of how we build on this foundational base. So if we first talk about the core leadership competency, I like to ask the question in the board overall, as well as the individual board members, um, has this board member or candidate proven deep experience in strategy creation? Have they shown skill in proper and effective governance? Have they successfully led large teams, demonstrated an ability to motivate team members, and shown great leadership traits? These are all pretty basic questions that you would ask of somebody that you would expect to be in the true leadership realm and, and has the experience and the expertise in that space. So it's a given that you would ask for those types of uh, traits. What is typically overlooked is what I view as this second sphere uh, and this has to do with the operations expertise. And I will tell you straight up in this webinar and for all the speaking engagements that I do yearly, which is a significant amount, I always bring up the fact that many of those that claim they are great leaders or would make great board candidates or even claim that they are great board candidates, they 
possess many of the leadership skills I just mentioned a moment ago, but where they lack is in the correlation of that leadership experience to the actual operations side to this. So a quick example of this is a board member that is pushing for a certain strategy or a certain goal of the organization in a certain time frame and they have not right-sized that strategy and goal for that particular size of organization. That is a direct failure of that leader or that board member not having the depth of operations knowledge to properly support the CEO in some of the decision-making that needs to get done. So I typically look for a board member above and beyond the core leadership competency. I want them to have in-depth operations expertise, so deep experience in implementing their strategies, having created effective governance mechanisms, showing the ability to right-size their strategy, and adapt their strategy to ever-changing delivery challenges. We're going to talk a little bit further in this webinar about the ability to change, which I think is one of the fundamental aspects of a true board director, having that ability to do so. So we've just focused initially on the core fundamental pieces of a, a board director, and this is when we start to get into what I view as this outside area of the sphere of influence. Uh, again, looking at the vertical experience areas. So I'm looking at which skill set companies, competencies, and experiences are most important to the business. Finance, technology, marketing, all different examples here. Now, this is typically the only area that a board, especially that's uh, an immature board, is focused on. They're saying, okay, this person has experience and background and expertise in this one area, and they will go ahead and, and offer this board position to this to this particular candidate. I will show you that this is just one layer or one level of how we want to evaluate and look at a proper board or, and, and board director and multiple board directors and how they operate as a team. So a few examples of how this is applied. And if I look at a few examples from some of the clients I work with in my board consulting realm, um, this is an exa actual example from a te technology services business. And we wanted to look at this, each particular board member coming in with a core leadership competency, with an operations background, and then individually with a skill set around each one of these particular areas that we defined here. So you'll see things such as legal and cybersecurity and technology, right? All the things that you would expect to see. But in some cases, you may say, well, it's interesting that you show politics and ties to legislation. Well, it's not any secret that the legislation that comes out uh, through whether it be state or federal government can have direct implications on the revenue and the growth of a technology company. So we wanted someone that understood that, that was tied in closely in this case with uh, some sort of political connection that understood what was happening in the, in the realm of politics so we could actually plan for that and create our strategies around that. So it's a way, again, of looking at this sphere of influence in the vertical realm as what type of skill sets that are you looking for and do you need to properly support your business. This is one example from a technology services business. Another example, a development uh, business. So when I say development, I'm, uh, development, I'm specifically talking about real estate development. And this was a board that was involved in everything from brokerage side of the business to construction to investment. Um, so you may see some very unorth unorthodox areas here of what you would expect for backgrounds on a board. I will say that every board has its own unique responsibilities and every board has its own unique expertise needs. In this case, we wanted someone at the board uh, at the board level that had construction background, that had retail and marketing background, that had real estate background. This created a, a very in-depth uh, discussions uh, and, and all sorts of decision making that we could actually do at the board level. So remember that um, each board, the way it's designed and the structure of it, each board is also dependent on each individual company and it should be that way. One other example here. So if we take the skill set areas and map them back to board committee areas, which is where I believe the work should get done on a board, we start to look across the same model of the sphere of influence in your vertical areas and say, well, if the expertise areas we've defined, that should actually be a direct correlation to the committees and where the work gets done on a board. So in this example of a nonprofit organization, we specifically separated out the program and outreach committee. What are we actually supplying and, and uh, giving our, our members and, and uh, the folks that uh, utilize the organization? We have marketing communications committee, a membership committee. Development committee in this case is talking about fundraising and sponsorship. This is a true peak inside of this nonprofit organization at its sphere of influence stating that we want at least one member of the board to have true 
in-depth expertise and experience in each one of these areas. And we would expect in this case of this example that each one of those folks that had that in-depth experience would actually lead that committee area. So we had full coverage in this particular board design. You'll see emeritus board on the side here as well as advisors and how they're pieced in here. Um, in some cases, I like to keep those functions uh, of expertise separate from the actual board members because I do view the board members as having uh, an increased responsibility and roles and responsibilities uh, in, in, their, in their involvement as a board director. And if we look at all these areas, and again, we're talking about our sphere of influence in terms of the vertical considerations, there's a few different models we can look at of how to build this. We can simply do a board of directors where everybody that is supplying information or acting in a governance and strategic role in the organization at the board level is part of the board of directors. One example, that's structuring option one. Number two, Early stage companies uh, like to also look at how do we start with a board of advisors, see how they operate, and then see if we get the value out of them, and then move it into more of a structure of a board of directors. So in this structure in option two, we talk about everybody that's involved at the board level as a board of advisor or a board advisor. Um, we showed an example earlier of this. Board of directors is your main group. You have a board of advisors supplying expertise and experience for very specialized areas of questions or projects or task forces, wherever basically their expertise is needed. And the last model is kind of a mix. You'll see some private companies actually do this. In fact, some nonprofits you'll see here as well. Um, sitting around the same table, you'll see your board of directors mixed with your board of advisors. Um, this can sometimes work. I typically recommend that if you're coming to a vote, that your anybody who's taking the meeting notes, whether it's the board secretary or someone else that's designated that's is taking the meeting minutes, that they are very clear of the voting members versus the non-voting voting members, which of course the board of directors will be voting and the board of advisors will be non-voting. A um, couple of other considerations here as uh, it pertains to insurance or DNO or director and officer insurance, but just know this option exists. Um, it's not as prevalent as the previous three that I, I showed uh, just before this slide. So all of these considerations under your sphere of influence, they touch on the important foundational aspects of your board to build from. If you remember, I mentioned a moment ago that many boards just stop at this point. They say, well, I have the expertise now and I have a skill set and this person knows their stuff in this area. And the biggest problem is that the board's uh, architect in this case stops at this point and says, well, you know, we have everything we need. I'm going to show you there's another few levels to this that you want to consider. And this next area are your considered your horizontal considerations and what I call your planes of congruence. Um, and the easiest way to visualize this is that if you look at the bottom of this page where you see the blue sphere of influence, picture that circle that we just discussed a moment ago laying down flat. And now we're going to lay what I'm calling these planes of congruence above this. And these are your horizontal considerations. And some examples of that. So, Above and beyond the skill sets and the leadership and the operational experience, we say, what are some other areas of character that we want to make sure that we infuse into our board? And a few examples of this, plain one, strategy and governance expertise. I will tell you for the boards that I build, this is a given, excuse me, that every single board should, as plain number one, have strategy and governance expertise of an expectation of every single board member. Uh, truly, this is what they're doing is when they're sitting on a board. So if someone comes in and does not have a, a, an in-depth understanding of governance, they will not be valuable on your board. If they do not have an in-depth understanding and in-depth experience of strategy, they will not be valuable on your board. So I, I always make that one of the first ones, that plane number one, is, as a given. Some other planes for this example board, age range and generational span. They wanted to make sure they were getting a look across three, possibly four different generation ranges. Diversity of women to men ratio, personality traits, emotional intelligence, uh, and the common vertical knowledge. Let me show you on the next page here what this looks like. So this board came up with these particular uh, criterion around each one of these areas. So every single board member was considered to have to have strategy and governance ex expertise. It was required. An age range and generational span was quite quite wide, 35 to 80 years of age. They wanted to get both ends of the spectrum and in between on this for the diversity of thought and the diversity of perspective on their board. Diversity in terms of women to men ratio. They were looking for a minimum of 30% women. I applaud this when I see this. It's uh, for those that have heard me speak before, uh, I am a proponent of 
absolute having women on boards and i can tell you that the performance numbers don't lie when you have a significant number of women on a board the companies perform better personality traits this is one that's not focused on uh, i should say it's focused on very rarely and i like to look for a balance across a board of different personality types and i always classify or categorize them in four areas, an analyst, a diplomat, a sentinel, or an explorer. I want to know that I don't have a whole board of sentinels, which are protectors. All they care about is what the bylaws state, and if it's outside of that, we're not going to think outside the box. Um, I don't want to have all just analysts who are only looking at the data and making decisions on that. Um, the, the key in this is that each one of these personality types brings a different perspective, brings a different viewpoint, and brings different data to the table and how they think. And it's important for boards to have a balance of these particular uh, personality types. Emotional intelligence, uh, plane number five, another hugely important area. Um, I can tell you that many boards, if I boil down what their particular issues were and where they, these issues uh, resided, I can tell you it's because many of them had low, what I viewed as low emotional intelligence, not being able to take criticism in its, in its proper format, meaning that they would become angry or upset if somebody uh, said that their idea was no good or they had data to prove otherwise. Um, this, this is something where it's the ability to listen, it's the ability to process, the ability to understand why we're having discussions and deliberations at the board level without taking it personally. Plane number six here for this example for uh, services business that I did some work for in the past, um, this is quite surprising to many because they believe that every single board member in a board uh, should have the same background or should have that same industry experience or industry vertical experience as the company that uh, they're, they're potentially becoming a board member for. I will tell you that's the biggest mistake that a board can make. And I will always push for no more than 25% of the board has the same industry overlap, meaning that 75% uh, of that board should actually be from different industries uh, or, or different industry verticals if they're going to be close in, uh, to, to that particular area of expertise or what that company supplies in terms of services or product. The reason for that is that when I come back to this diversity of thought and diversity of perspective, you want the board members in this to look at things from a different perspective. You want to understand what somebody in a different industry is doing when it comes to marketing or what technology they're using. Many times the boards become very insulated because of this, uh, that they're not looking outside of their industry for, for their upcoming board members. Uh, and they're very insulated and we all know what happens when a board or a company becomes very insulated in today's day and age. It just doesn't, it doesn't work out the way it should. So these were six. I mean, some, some organizations may have eight or 10 or 12 different planes that can grow instead of looking for. Uh, the key to this, is that you're looking across these different planes of congruence and understanding that there's a deeper meaning and a deeper way or architecture of looking at how you create this character of your board, which in many cases, the character is more important than the skill set and the expertise areas. I know that's debatable. I love to say it because I think it uh, invokes some questions in people. But if, if we want to be fair in that comment, I would say, take the understanding and the application of your planes of congruence considerations with the same ferocity that you would your experience and expertise that we talked about in your sphere of influence. Here are some other planes of congruence to consider for your board uh, when you're evaluating either, say, a retiring board member and you're looking at a new candidate to come in for an established board, or if you're building a board from scratch, these are the types of things that you can look at as you build uh, the requirements uh, and the aim to areas for your planes of congruence. So. For the planes of congruence area, they are adding the depth and character to your board, which is the thing truly that ultimately drives value. I would say and add to that comment that for the boards that I'm on and the boards that I consult, this is what makes board directorship fun. It actually makes you, you feel like you're in a group of people that you love to be around because they become your family and they should. If you're not feeling that or if you're on a board and you're not seeing that camaraderie, it typically is because the, the architecture was not correct to begin with and you don't have a balance of, the, um, of this architecture and many times that comes back to an area of the planes of congruence when you talk about the different personality types and the emotional intelligence level. Okay, so we're building as we go here. We talked about your sphere of influence, which is your leadership, your operational experience, and your skill set and expertise areas. We then laid that flat and we built our planes of congruence, which is the character of your board, the different areas of additional requirements or balance across your board. 
What I want to show you now is that you have another layer here to consider, and this is what I like to call your experience and expertise, expertise, uh, experience and uh, expertise depth. Sorry, I couldn't get that out. And let me walk through this chart very quickly. You'll you'll get the concept of this uh, very fast. But if we look at across the top, we say that our sphere of influence or, or our expertise areas as it pertains to the sphere of influence. In this case, we had technology, human resources, finance, product, marketing, sales, and legal. And in these areas, many boards make the mistake that they only have one expert on the board in these areas. Now, I would tell you that you want the person that's the absolute expert typically to be the chair of that committee area. However, I like to look for additional depth of people on the board or other board members that also have that experience and expertise. And here's the reason why. I'm gonna use the finance column as an example. And in this case, um, board member three has subject matter expertise. They have a very in-depth knowledge of finance. And that is good because we have someone potentially that could be the lead or the, uh, the chair of the finance committee. Board member number four, if we look at number two, they have a deep knowledge. This means they've applied it, they've utilized it, they may not be to the same level of, of an SME, but they have a deep knowledge. And board member six, who in this case, in our, our model here, will not serve as a committee chair, but will maybe be part of the committee, they also have a subject matter expert knowledge. What's great about this is that this is where you start to get into the discussions both in the board committee meetings uh, as well as the board meeting itself. It's allowing for possibly dissenting viewpoints or further depth uh, in any discussions that come up. In other words, it's not just one expert that has experience in that space where nobody else can challenge that. An example of where we don't see this in the model currently uh, would be in human resources or human capital, which is the second column. And in that column, we have two folks that are board member three and board member four. They have deep knowledge, but no one that's a subject matter expert. That to me is a, is a miss on this particular board because they don't have somebody operating as a subject matter expert. This is a very simple study that can be done on your board uh, and also can be done as part of a rebuild or a build from scratch to say, I'm looking for someone that comes in with multiple expertise areas. They may be a subject matter expert in one, but they have two or three deep knowledge areas that I know will add depth to my board and allow me to have the types of discussions and debates for that matter uh, that, that will bring value to my company. Some of the considerations to look for here. So ensuring knowledge, depth, and expertise coverage across your board allows for deeper idea sharing. It allows for those discussions to take place. It brings you to a higher level of outcome when you have those particular expertises and that overlap on a board, uh, an important consideration. And another area that's not typically focused on when we look at building of boards or rebuilding or even evaluating existing boards is what I like to call their behavioral, behavioral predisposition and aligning this properly on a board. And there's a few ways to look at this. Um, I've added a few over the years in this realm of, of working in the, in the board space, and I do view it as an industry in itself because I do believe it's a discipline around understanding uh, board directorship and, and operating it in, a, uh, in this vertical in, in, in a proper way. And what I've seen over the years is that typically there's a balance across different areas of importance when you're evaluating or even working with other board members. And IQ and intelligence, this is uh, so, somewhat of a given. You want to be sitting around the table with people that you respect, people that are experts in their field, people that come to the table with certain experience uh, and background. Uh, know that when I say IQ or intelligence here, it's a direct match back to their experience and expertise as it pertains to the sphere of influence. I'm not saying in the overall IQ test that you're a 120, a 130, a 140, whatever that number is. I'm saying, what is your intelligence and your, and your experience, particularly in your area of focus or your industry? Emotional EQ, emotional intelligence, another area. You want to make sure that if you're getting into debates with a board, it's not becoming personal. It's all at the professional level. You understand why it's healthy to debate. Why somebody, uh, if, if they're giving you feedback, try to think about the reason they're giving you that feedback, not just become angry about the fact that they are, you know, in your mind that they are a foe to you or they're pushing back on your idea. Um, a board that has high emotional intelligence is truly unstoppable. It's amazing the levels of camaraderie they can reach and the levels of discussion they can reach without feeling that they're offending somebody or that that person's going to be offended. It really is a big difference. 
The two that most people do not see today are the next two I'm going to talk about. One is called team intelligence. This is an interesting one, and um, I like to compare it almost to mob mentality, meaning that um, you could have a board filled with people with very high IQ, very high EQ or emotional intelligence, but when they get together, they operate differently for some reason. And there's ways to see why this is the case. Um, and I, I, again, like to compare it to mob mentality. The person that has done the, uh, the work in the background and the study of this would probably kill me if they heard me saying it that way, but I think it's the easiest way to describe it. Some boards individually, even some that I've worked with, when I said individually, it is some of the savviest board directors I've ever seen. But when they get together, for some reason, it just doesn't work. And digging into this team intelligence or understanding how uh, collectively they work is another way to understand how effective and efficient your board is. And mindfulness. You're going to hear more and more about mindfulness as we get into the upcoming years. Um, I personally have launched another national speaking tour with a friend of mine who I view as an expert uh, and a pioneer in this mindfulness intelligence space. Her name is Linda Bjork. And uh, I will tell you that this mindfulness side truly is an area that for me is uh, what defines a, a great leader. It's not just their knowledge and their expertise, it's how they apply it, it's, it's how they're mindful and thinking on many different levels of how they're applying their knowledge and trying to get people to do what they want them to do and show them why it benefits them as well. That's a mindful approach. Uh, these four areas, IQ, EQ, TQ, and MQ, again, are super important uh, of a balance to make a board successful. Um, I will tell you also, I, I know we're a little bit limited on time today, but if you're interested in more of this topic of these evaluating board members at these four levels, I write about this extensively in my book, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we get to the close of the presentation shortly. And when we talk about this mix of IQ, EQ, TQ, and MQ, we start to look at this and say, if we meld all those together, it really is all focusing in this ability to change. You may not be the best at, at mindfulness today, but that, that does not mean that someone can't reach a high level of mindfulness or, or emotional intelligence. It takes work. It takes practice. So I like to think that you want to test potential board candidates or even police yourself to start to say, is there a way for me to monitor how good a change I am? So many times when I do this, uh, this the larger part of this presentation of the speaking live, I kind of wait to see the audience's reaction when they, this is one of my favorite cartoons out there because it shows that need to change right going from a caterpillar to a butterfly um, so i would tell you that in order for you yourself to become a better board member or in the architecture or the building and the structuring of a board you truly want to test out that your board members are open for change they're able to lead through it I think of words uh, even such as transformation. Have they worked with transformation projects before? Have they done transformation or coached others before? This is truly another aspect that makes boards extremely powerful, but it starts with the individual board members. They have to embrace change. All right, board committees. So when I talk about board committees, know that there are truly two different types of board committees. Standing committees, these are typically formed uh, and they're permanent type of committees uh, within a board. Uh, many times you'll see these as a finance committee or a technology committee. It really is up to that, uh, that company or that board itself what they want to define as their standing committees. And then you move to ad hoc committees. Ad hoc com uh, committees are typically ones that are formed for a specific task. Um, it usually has a beginning and an end. You can think of these uh, most, most typically as projects. Um, and these ad hoc committees may actually join members of different committees across this board uh, to make sure they have the depth and the experience behind them. So know there's really two different types of board committees that you can be involved with and, and how you want to structure your, your committees within your board. And the purpose of board committees uh, is to truly further drill down into the governance, coordination, research, and discipline of the organization itself. So I want to be cautious when I say this. I don't mean that you want to pierce the veil of uh, the noses in, fingers out approach where you're, you're able as a board member to be internal, sniffing around, trying to see the information or find the information that you need uh, to make educated decisions, but uh, your fingers are out so you're not undermining management or the CEO. So in saying that, a committee has a unique ability and opportunity to get to another level of understanding. And in some cases, uh, by having this input at the committee level, 
um, they're able to make the right decisions and get the right information and do the right research and do the right coordination, all the things that we mentioned here. I'm a stickler, however, for board committees. Um, that's where the work should be done on a board and the, the level of discussion is slightly or can be more tactical at the board committee level. Um, I'm a fan of that because it separates those tactical discussions out of the boardroom setting, which to me is a whole different level of discussion. So a quick understanding of what the board committees are there to do and the importance of them. And if we look at uh, one further drill down of the benefit of board committees is that, as I mentioned, it can connect the board to the larger company and it allows for focused efforts on a specific need or task. This truly is why board committees are formed uh, and it also is a way to keep the board itself um, from being mired down in some of these nitty gritty or more tactical discussions and uh, initiatives across the organization. So one of the things I will say consistently is that the board committee structure as well as the committee chairs themselves make or break the effectiveness of the entire board. This goes back to the fact that I believe that the committee or the committees are where the true work gets done on a board and then the outcomes of those committee sessions and the committee findings that is what that is what's presented and voted on or decided or debated at the board level meeting at the board meeting level and many times i get the questions uh which committees do I implement? How do I decide these committees? And the way I like to start this discussion is to first say that you want to look at some that are pretty common that you likely need for any board of any size company or any type of entity, whether it be nonprofit, private, or public. Um, so number one, I would say you want to absolutely leverage your sphere of influence categories. If you felt you needed a certain expertise in a board director, or a board member on your team, it's very likely you need that as a committee area as well. So I, I like to say that as a starting point, if you need the expertise, you likely need a committee area for that too, where the work is going to get done and some of the decisions will get, will get done to be presented to the overall board. I also believe that you should always have a strategic planning committee, a finance committee, and a legal committee. And again, that goes for whatever size of business or entity type. And I would also tell you to be open to non-standard board committees for private sector businesses, and I could probably even add to this for uh, nonprofit organizations. If you feel you need a specific expertise on your board, it's likely that, again, you want to correlate that back to a type of committee or a specific committee that can handle that type of work within the board. It's a nice way of packaging. It's clean. It's easy. Uh, it's a nice way of looking at this architecture and this structure in, in what, what I view as one of the simplest ways and where you get the most value from it. I put in here just for the sake, I won't read all these of course, but for the sake of the presentation going out to everybody on this webinar, uh, just to give you some reminders and some thought provoking uh, areas here that you may consider for potential standing committees uh, and potential ad hoc committees. It may raise some, uh, some thoughts for you as you build and rebuild a board for your organization. Remember uh, for everything I'm mentioning here that the board meeting should begin where the board committee and uh, the board committees and the board member preparation ends. Meaning that when I'm in, when I'm called in to consult to a board and I understand and I'm witnessing that they are debating at a very tactical level or bringing up ideas and proposals for the first time in the board meeting, I know that board is way off track. That is not the purpose of a board meeting. The board meeting is to bring folks together, bring the board together specifically to talk about the work that was done within the committee areas that has everything packaged in a way that's already been read by the board members. They've had time to ask their questions even offline because hopefully the information was provided a week or two in advance. In advance, And they move from there to the any objections or any, uh, I'll say last minute uh, facts that have come into play since the information was disseminated to the board. Uh, and then they move to a vote from there. That truly is is why the board committees are important. They're they're keeping the effectiveness and the efficiency of the actual board meeting uh, to to the top level. And a few of the expectations to talk about when we think about boards and and these the next two lists that you're going to see are things that I've looked at over the course of ten years. And I've changed these some of these over time, or I've added certain words. Um, but I've truly for the last five years or so. I've kind of leveled out and said that I really believe that in the number and the hundreds of boards I've worked with, I truly think this is the expectation of boards and individual board members. 
Um, for these, I'll read all four. For the next list, I'm not going to do that. You know, I'll pick a few of them that I think are important. But at least for the expectations of boards, um, to tr it's truly to remain primarily strategic. And in the past, I was asked the question, well, what does that mean? How could I break that down? What are you saying? Is it a 50-50? Is it more? And I like to look at it this way, 90% strategic, meaning that you're focusing at a higher level in your discussion and your involvement. You're looking at the strategic area or the how. Remember, strategy is the how. You're supporting your goals, which are your what. So a board that is very much focused on the how we're supporting the what, which are our goals, is truly in the right path of what they're brought in to do. Because I think two words when I think of that, I think of strategic involvement, and I also think of I should have said I think of two phrases, strategic involvement and the level of governance uh, that should be correct by having an understanding of the data you need to, to do the proper uh, strategic evaluations and to perform the proper governance. So the balance I typically look for is 90% strategic and 10% tactical. And that 10% tactical, I look to be uh, for that to be applied in the committee space, which again, allows you to get the pulse and the feel for what's happening at the at the company level, not just at the board level. So remaining primarily strategic is a, is a huge expectation for a properly constructed and a properly uh, operating board. Keeping the organization on track to its core values, vision, and mission. Um, for those that know me, it's you, you already know that I, I will always list values first. I think every company starts with its values, making those real. And that's the, really the only way to properly support your future vision and your current mission of the organization. Uh, another expectation of a board, fostering a clear and viable strategic company roadmap. So as I mentioned earlier, if, if you remember back to one of my planes of congruence, the first one, it said in-depth knowledge and governance and strategy. The reason for that is because an expectation of a board or a board member, it requires them to be able to both foster, create, support, a strategic company roadmap for that organization. So how would you expect someone without that background to do it properly? The answer is that you can't. And number four here, leverage knowledge and relationships to further the organization. That doesn't just mean in a financial way to bring in, say, or make introductions for, at the client level. What I'm talking about is this could even be um, making recommendations for someone to come in to give uh, ongoing education or anything that this board actually can bring uh, to the table to make it a more effective and more productive board. So it's at multiple levels, I mean, this knowledge and relationships to further the organization. So those are the four main areas I look at for expectations of boards. I think it's a nice, clean, and, and compact way of looking at it. If I look at the 11 traits of a great board, or I could even say 11 traits of a great board member, um, and look at it from both sides. I'll just read a few of these here. Um, it's not by chance that the first one shows up at the top. Respectful equals constructive equals effective. This is absolutely something where some boards have lost their way. And you'll see them in between breaks where you have these little clicks that form in the hallways and the lobbying starts and they're coming back in. And it's it's not really done in a, in a way that, in my mind, builds camaraderie or is going to build respect and make that board uh, constructive and effective. So remember that when we're looking at the components of emotional intelligence and mindfulness, this all plays in. You should start to see now by the time we get to this point in this webinar that all of these things are important. You could have the, the table of the smartest people in the world. But if they can't work together properly, or they're not respectful of one another, you will get nowhere. In fact, it becomes more of a burden on the company than, uh, than anything else. Um, I, of course, will, will, will pick uh, bullet item number five or six here, which is proper foundational structure of boards and committees. Go about your board build or your rebuild uh, in such a way where you're applying this discipline to it. There truly is a discipline to this. I can tell you that of the hundreds of boards I've worked with, if they have just gone about their build or their rebuild or if they had board members in the public space that were retiring and they were bringing somebody new in, if they just had this plan or roadmap, they would not be in some of the areas that they're in today. And the expectation of that board and the company itself would be different. I talk about a culture of transparency here, a few, uh, a few check marks up from the bottom. In-person meeting attendance. I'm not saying every meeting in terms of uh, committee meetings, board committee meetings, but I am a fan that the face-to-face -face and understanding the body language and building the camaraderie and the friendship, um, even something as, as simple as the dinner the night before or the night after the board meeting, that's what builds camaraderie. You can't do that over a Skype call or, or a video call or even a conference call for that matter. 
All right. And I mentioned here also the wide range of backgrounds, industries, and, and expertise. Of course, a given that uh, this, is, this is something that you want. Do not be afraid to look at folks or, or potential board candidates that are outside of your particular industry vertical. As I mentioned earlier, uh, I'm particularly looking in, in my board builds, I'm trying to, to push for no more than 25% overlap of that board member in that or having a background or having coming from that uh, particular industry vertical. So some of the points here, I won't read every single one to you, uh, but uh, I, I can probably talk for hours and days about each one of these areas. But we're driving towards this culture of transparency, of course, both internally in the board as well as externally. We know of words such as activist investors and, and uh, some of the debacles that we've seen across the years now. Uh, boards are no longer behind this this veil. Uh, everything is is uh, public. Whether you're not, if, even if you're not a public company, uh, the information is going to get out. So you want to make sure you're doing the right things. You can start with this, uh, firstly, this architecture. So a few things as we'll, we'll move into some questions in a moment, but a few things in closing here. Uh, approach your board build or rebuild in a disciplined manner. Know that there is a structure. Know that there is an architecture behind this uh, to make this truly successful and, and avoid years of stagnation. You can use this presentation as your roadmap. Um, you definitely want to embrace change and make sure that your other uh, fellow board members or even the board candidates you're evaluating are truly embracing, uh, or embracing change. Um, and a few last points here. I welcome you to read my book. This is uh, everything today was kind of the high level brush stroke. My book goes into depth. It's not one of those books that just gives you theory. It's a true roadmap. It gives you the step by step process. And it's in the order and chronology of events of doing this to the level that I think you can do it. Reach out if you need help in doing this. I'm a board consultant. I sit on boards. I can help you with the process. Uh, I also do continuing education for boards. I think all of this is linked back to uh, creating this, this proper culture on your board. Uh, and the last thing I, I, I think, uh, Nick, you may have mentioned, is I have a newsletter. It goes out to about 25,500 readers now in over 65 countries, and it touches on leadership, C-level, and board topics. So you can visit my website and sign up for that. Uh, it's a once-a-month once newsletter, and uh, a lot of the concepts and strategies I've talked about today, I break those down and look at those at, uh, not just from different angles of industry, uh, but also uh, from some of the things that we can apply from modern-day instances and, and uh, look at how they correlate. So with that, Nick, I will turn back over to you for some of the questions, and uh, I thank you. Sure, uh, thank you again, Mark. Uh, that was that was really informative. Um, and I, I just want to remind everybody right now that if you have any questions, you can go ahead and send them on over, and we'll start taking them over the last ten minutes here. I see that we have at least one in, um, and so Mark, uh, this kind of transitions as well into our product as well. We talk a lot about strategy here at Passageways and how having the technology and that mentality that you've been speaking about really kind of going hand in hand can lead to a lot of success, right? And the, the central question is, um, in your experience, how has discussion of strategy, what's a real world example of strategy in the boardroom that's affected something? Um, so what, what are people looking for um, when we talk about strategy? What kinds of discussions should they be having? Sure, sure. And it's a good question. And I will tell you that uh, in much of the speaking that I do, um, and I didn't do this in the earlier years, but I do it now because I realize there's such a misunderstanding of what strategy is. And, and I, I actually wish that I included uh, a, di a simple diagram of this here, but I, I, can, I can lay it out verbally here for those on the, on the webinar. So I'll say it this way. If you picture two circles um, side by side, um, to the left, you see the word goals in that circle, and to the right, you see the word tactics or, or, or uh, actions. Well, what sits in between those is this double-sided arrow called strategy. And what's interesting to look at this in such a simple format is that I've worked with groups where they say, we're going through our strategic planning, and I'll say, well, can you show me your goals? And they'll say, well, our strategic plan is our goals. And I'll say, no, it's not, because you can't have a strategic plan without understanding what your goals are first. And what's interesting about this is that if you change the words of strategy and goals, strategy becomes, again, the word how, and goal becomes the word what. So in order to understand how you're going to support that goal or what your strategy is going to be, you need to first understand what the goals are, and then you align your strategies to that. 
Um, and that to me is one of the basic understandings or should be one of the basic understandings of saying if you're doing strategic planning, if you haven't defined your goals first and foremost, you've actually missed the whole purpose of, of why you're doing strategic planning. And the how can change. There really is no right or wrong way to do the how because you have three components of consideration. You have budget, scope, and time. So if you if you have a budget and you and you're looking as an example, let, let's let's use the onboard software as an example right now, right? So if we want to increase the level of communication um, and the speed and efficiency on our board, we may say we want to allocate or one of our goals is to make our board more efficient. And the how do we do that is we allocate budget and maybe create in one of the committees or an ad hoc committee to do a study of this and work, you know, and, and work with passageways as an example. I'll, I'll give you the credit here for hosting. <laughs> <the board. laughs> um, and that board committee or the ad hoc committee or the task force would then go and do the study based on the fact they have budget, scope, and time to apply to that. That's a prime example. Now, that's, a, that's an example of a strategy application within the board itself. But if we look at the board's support of a CEO or the C-level or the overall organization, and I'll say through the CEO, that's a little different. That to me is falling at the governance level where I would say to the CEO, tell me what you believe our goals should be for 2019 and then show me how you plan on getting there. So I just asked two questions, the goals, which are the what, and the strategy, which is the how. Now, the CEO is then responsible for all the things that sit on the other side of that double-sided strategy arrow, which are the tasks, right? That's the responsibility and the operations side of the CEO. They're going to implement that. They're going to get that done. As a board member, I need to understand strategy and governance as it applies to supporting the goals because that's what I'm holding that CEO responsible for. That's how I'm measuring their performance. Yeah, so, I really like the uh, budget, scope, and time you're talking about, too, because when I've had interactions with individuals, I tend to talk about the opportunity cost that comes with having uh, board members who aren't prepared or the inability to get your materials in, in advance, the discussions that you're not having because of right. that, right? And so, that's right. Um, that's right. I, I have uh, two other questions here, though. Um, they are fairly similarly linked. Um, the first one is my organization has a very large board. It's uh, between 45 and 50 people. Mm -hmm. Any suggestions about managing such a large group? And then the second question is, is there an ideal number of board members? So I think those kind of go hand in hand. So let me, yes, let me answer the second one first. There is no such thing as an ideal number of board members. Um, but I will say typically the smaller the board, the easier it is to manage and to schedule, which is probably the reason you're asking number one about the 40 something board members. So, you know, I, I typically don't enter whether it's a board I'm building for one of my companies or rebuilding for one of my companies, or if it's a board through what, some of the consulting work I do, I don't go in with a set number in my mind of how many board members that, that board should actually contain. The reason for that is that my first exercise is to build my sphere of influence and say, what expertise do I need? Before I start saying this person and X, XYZ name would be great for our board, I'm trying to drive people to say, forget about the names and the people you know, go and do the architectural structuring first and say, for my company to thrive, what type of expertise and experience would I want in my board? And that drives the size. So that's that's the first side of, of that question. And I can tell you, you're probably talking about a nonprofit board if you're talking about that many members on the board itself. And I get the fact, I understand that many times there is the aspect of those board members are cutting checks and they're somehow involved in the organization. So I get I get that point of it. But no, when you're talking about the core board where the voting and the decision gets done, it typically is nice to keep that board at about six, eight, ten people uh, in that realm, depending on what your business is, is focused in, whether it be product or services or a combination of the two. So that's the first side to this. Um, the second question, uh, and let me make sure I'm answering both questions right now. So we talked about the size of the board um, and what's ideal. Another thing to keep in mind uh, to this question is how do you make a, a board of this size more efficient? And the first things that pop into my mind are, number one, committees, as we discussed. Get those people involved, even if it's all 40 of them, at somehow at a leadership level of a board uh, as a chair of, of, of one of your committee areas or an ad hoc committee or as a committee member. Get them involved, put some structure around their involvement so you're getting value from them, not just a figurehead uh, around the table that chimes in with an idea once in a while. The other thing that I think of is your executive committee or your ELC, your executive leadership committee or executive leadership team on the board. 
Um, typically, when your board gets to a certain size, you assign a committee that is a, in many cases, it can be voted. So, you, you know, the board itself is deciding uh, who the chair is and, and, and other areas when you're talking about uh, nonprofit boards. Um, and that executive committee can take the initiative based on the bylaws to actually make some of the decisions or package up some of the decisions to be considered across the board itself. So the secret weapon for large boards is that executive committee or that executive leadership ELC um, that you can leverage to do so. Uh, but typically you have to match that back to your bylaws to make sure it is legally something that you can do and that the organization is bought into it. So we've had several more questions roll in since we uh, started wrapping up this webinar. And I know that we have about four minutes here. So um, we can try to go quickly, uh, but some of them may not get answered. So our apologies to anybody on the webinar. Uh, the first one is, who is the most ap appropriate individual of, to build a board uh, or to rebuild it? CEO, board chair, uh, outside individuals, uh, what would you say to that individual? Um, well, I mean, you know, I'm going to stay neutral in this because, you know, that is my business that I do that. Yeah. But, I, you know, to me, I, I do view it as a discipline. So, you know, if I take that out of the question here, I will say the following. Remember that a board's role is not just to select a CEO, but also to govern and monitor that CEO. Um, so for a for a CEO to build the board is actually counterintuitive if you look at it from a standpoint of governance. Now, I understand that we could talk about private companies, and of course, you know, if you're the CEO and, and you, you're the founder and the CEO of the business, you want to likely you're going to be the one that's building your board. I get it. But you also want to make sure that you're not eliminating the value of having all yes men or yes women on your board. They're there for a specific reason that you, you want them to give you reality, you want the real world answers and the real world input. So I would just I would caution any CEO that's building their board, and this this would be the case in a private company, that they're being very open and understanding of why the architecture works that we discussed today when it's built properly, um, and there is a level of emotional maturity and and uh, mindfulness that you have to play into to to build that properly and allow board members to speak their mind in a in a constructive way if if they're in disagreement with the CEO. Um, but the one thing, you know, just just uh, in closing to this question, Nick, I would say is that most most business leaders and the reason I got into this space was because it was failing. And, you know, the, the reason for my book is the same reason now is that there's a discipline behind this. It's not to say that you, you're not able to build your own board, but but give yourself the right tools to understand that. So one tool may be that you read my book. Right. And, and that, that walks you through it. I, I feel very confident that somebody that reads the book will understand the inner mechanisms of how to do this. But then you you encounter the time constraint. Right. So if we look at everything, it's got constraints of three things. It's got your time, scope and budget. So if I look at those three areas, you may say, well, now I understand the architecture of this, but I don't have the time to do it. That's where someone from the outside, such as myself, can come in to guide you through it at varying levels. It could be soup to nuts helping out or just giving you giving that person guidance uh, as they go through as, as an advisor. So there's multiple ways to do this. Uh, I'm happy to hear that question, however, because it, it's it's the it's focusing in the right area of the how do you get this done to reach the goal of building a proper board it is that how that matters that's your strategy absolutely uh, and we we had a few questions that came in about the uh expertise uh, coverage analysis how to complete it um i would say that there are tools out there i know that onboard is one of them that has uh complete kinds of survey tools built in in order to communicate with your board um i don't know if you want to fill in any kind of additional information about uh, how you would complete the expertise coverage analysis and who would be the right person uh, to do that in the organization. But those are the final two questions we can close out on. And then I'll say a couple last words. Sure. So, I, yeah, I mean, it's definitely tools to do this. You, you mentioned your tool, uh, Nick, and this as well through passageways with, with onboard, fully understood. Um, there's different levels you can mm -hmm. take this to. So some of the boards I've worked with, they didn't want to go and, and uh, use a tool specifically. They wanted people to do self-evaluations, <coughs> excuse me, because they trusted the answers back from this board. Uh, and this was done in such a case where I think two of the board members were retiring and they, they wanted to kind of go back to basics and look at their board from from the the you know, the, the level of, of forming it and saying, where do people fit today? And are we just replacing those that left in those skill sets? Or are we looking at this at a deeper level? So you can look at it from a self-evaluation point. You can take it to truly whatever level you wanted to. Um, I, I personally have worked at both levels where it's running just a very basic survey of self-evaluation all the way to using different tools. Um, and some of those tools, remember, it's not just the expertise evaluations, it's evaluations of the 
uh, areas of personality that I mentioned earlier. So um, I write about in my book. I'll, I'll give two quick examples in, in the remaining moments right now. Um, there's two tests I've used over the years that I've been blown away by their accuracy. And I used to only use them for hiring up to management level. And now I use them for hiring and evaluations even at the board level. One of them is called the Gordon Personal Profile, which I believe the company Pearson that makes this is changing the name of it to make it 